All right, welcome to the Bay Gardens Introduction to Vegetable Gardening in Containers. I'm Brittany Byer. I am the Gardens and Giving Girl Manager in Omaha. A little about me, I've been with Big Gardens since 2020. Um, I'm also going to school for horticulture. And my favorite thing to grow in containers is chocolate sprinkled tomatoes. Hello, I'm Molly Borain from the Big Garden in Kansas. I run the Community Garden and the Giving Grove Orchard Program and I serve rural Kansas and as well as rural Nebraska. And my favorite vegetable to grow in containers is strawberries, which is fruit, but still delicious. All right. So when starting seeds, we wanna think about what soil to use. When growing in containers, you want to use potting mix. I've made a diagram explaining the difference between potting soil and potting mix. Potting soil is made up of soil. It's nutrient rich, longer lasting, cheaper priced, it has low aeration, and it can get waterlogged. Some ingredients in potting soil are clay and sand, and they do not work in small containers. Potting mix. It is made up of a soilless ingredient, multiple ingredients, good aeration, and it has good drainage as well good water retention and it does it does cost more but and you will need to replace it over time all right what is in potting mix the soil list ingredients include peat moss which helps control ph levels perlite which helps speed up germination vermiculite which helps aerate and retain water pine bark which helps improve drainage and slow decomposition I put a little recipe at the bottom if you want to make your own soil. It takes about 10 quarts coconut core, 5 quarts perlite, 5 quarts vermiculite, 5 quarts compost. Optional stuff you can add are 2 cups fertilizer. This makes about 2 14 inch containers or 5 12 inch hanging baskets. So you might have to double or triple as needed. These are a few examples of containers that you could use. You have hanging baskets, window baskets, raised planter beds, cloth bags, plastic, ceramic, and terracotta pots. When using pots, you want to make sure that there are holes in the bottom to help with drainage. How to read a zone map. So when looking at your seed packet, some of them might have a map on the back. This is where you're going to want to pay attention to which colors so you know what things grow in your zone. So you're going to want to look at your state and your city to figure out which color lines up with it. Nebraska is a 5B growing zone, Upper Kansas is a 6A, and Lower Kansas is a 7. It's important to note that with climate change, the zones are shifting, so it's important to pay attention to your map. How to read a seed packet. So when looking at the back of your seed packet, you're going to want to know what type of seed it is. Is it an annual, which grows once a year and dies, a perennial, which it regrows every year continuously, or a vegetable, where you start from seed all the way to harvest. Ways of starting seeds. You have indoor cold stratification. You could use plug trays indoors that could be later transplanted, transplanted into another pot or you can direct sow straight into the pot. You want to note the days to germination, which means the total days from seed to first sprout, which could be 10, 30, 60, 90, or 120. Days to harvest means the total days from seedling to harvest, which also could be days to maturity. The spacing is the total space between each seed or plant. Thinning is when you have multiple growth per tray or pot. You'll remove the weakest growth and either compost it or place it in a new container to continue growing. Depth is the length of hole you need to create for your seed. Also, note that all seed packets don't have this kind of information, so research is your best friend. All right, so how to start a seed indoors. 
So step one, you're going to want to gather your seeds and supplies. Step two, fill your container with potting mix. Make sure to leave a gap for covering your seeds and watering. You don't want spillage. Step three, poke a hole in your pot and place your seed inside. Some seeds should get placed on top of the soil, so make sure to read your packet. Cover lightly with more soil. Step four, label your newly planted seeds. It's important so we don't have mystery plants growing later, which can be fun. Step five, lightly water your plant. You can also cover with a clear plastic lid or a clear plastic wrap to help with trapping moisture. Step six, next you'll place on a heat mat or in front of a window and the sunlight will help keep it warm. Step seven, uh, new seeds need about 12 to 16 hours of daily sunlight. And step eight, when the sprouts are about four to six inches above the soil, it's time to transplant into a larger container for outside. All right, so cold stratifying. This method is mainly used for native seeds and wildflowers. It's important to read your packet so you know to either soak your seeds one to two hours beforehand or you can place them directly on the coffee filters. So you're gonna start with a coffee filter, spray it with some water until damp. You're gonna to want to spread your seeds out on a single layer and fold the coffee filter over. You're gonna spray it and then place on a dry paper towel and wrap the paper towel around the coffee filter and spray again. You will possibly have mold, which it is okay. Um, once you have your filter and your towel damp, you're going to want to place it in a Ziploc bag and keep it in the refrigerator. It's important to label the variety and the start date on your bag. So you know, um, when looking at your seed, you're going to look at the date to germination. So that's the amount of time you want to keep it in the fridge. You're also going to check it every once in a while to make sure that it's still wet. So keep spraying if it is dry. Direct seed sowing. <laughs> Add soil to the pots you are using and fluff it around so it's light and free from clumps. Take your hand and poke the depth amount on seed packet into the soil. You can draw lines or poke holes. Pay attention to the spacing between each seed as well. Drop your seeds in the hole and cover the seed with light soil on top. You don't want to pat down hard. Uh, water your plant until it feels damp. You should check every day and water when feeling dry. Plants should get about 12 to 16 hours of sunlight. It's also um, important to note that with expired seeds, you should be putting more than one seed in the hole to promote better growth. All right, sunlight and supplemented light for outside. Outside sunlight plant tag information. So when looking at your seed packet, it's gonna either say full sun, part shade, or shade. When it says full sun, that's at least six hours of direct sunlight, no shadows. When it says part shade, that's four to six hours of direct sunlight. And when it says shade, that's less than four hours of direct sunlight. Choosing the location for your container garden. Your plants need sunlight, so you want to make sure that it is a must, that they are getting some sunlight. You're going to want to observe your yard at different times of the day to figure out the total amount of sunlight. and that will determine the best placement for your pots. Uh, if your um, plants are not getting enough sunlight, there are ways to supplement outside light, and that's hanging an LED lamp over your plants and use for an hour or two before the sun begins to set. Sunlight and supplemented light for indoors. Most indoor seeds perform best for 12 to 16 hours each day. Place seed containers in a sunny window and give the container a quarter turn every day to prevent the seedling from overreaching toward the light and developing weak, elongated stems. Indoor supplemental light. Use a double bulb fluorescent light to germinate and grow your seeds. If you do not have a broad spectrum fluorescent bulb, use a cool light and a warm light bulb together to provide the red and blue light spectrum. All right, so for some examples, Herbs, different varieties, uh, sage, parsley, Greek, oregano, rosemary, basil, thyme, and chives. How to plant. Start from seed indoors and then pot once mature. How to harvest. You can snip leaves off of herbs with sharp scissors or pruners. 
Longer stemmed herbs like cilantro, parsley, lavender, rosemary should be cut near the base of the branch. Leafy perennial herbs, oregano, thyme, sage, tarragon, are to be harvested by the stem in sprigs. How to store the herbs. If you're wanting to keep them wet, wrap them in a damp paper towel and store in a Ziploc bag in the fridge. You can also cut stems and place them in a glass of water. Those usually last about a week. For drying herbs, you can string them up to hang upside down and feel crunchy, and then store them in a jar for six months to three years. Tomatoes. Some good varieties would be San Marzano, Roma, Brandywine, Purple Cherokee, Celebi, or like I mentioned, uh, purple, the chocolate sprinkles. <laughs> uh, how to plant a tomato. If you want to choose a big pot with drainage, use potting mix, Transplant seedling into pot, don't direct seed. Water tomato plants daily, and it's important to keep the leaves dry. Dry. <laughs> when to harvest a tomato. A ripe, ready to pick tomato should be firm, but have a little give when pressed gently. Storage. They need to stay at room temperature, ideally in a single layer out of direct sunlight. Flowers. The variety examples are geraniums, Petunias, marigolds, nasturtium, African daisies, begonias, ivies, and zinnias. How to plant. Set the seedling in the container and decide on your option. Gently remove your plants from their pots. You want to try to disturb the roots as little as possible. Nestle the seedling in the soil and cover with more soil. Water until damp and check every day. If you're using a bulb, you're going to want to place a hole with the top facing up and cover with soil. Make sure to keep the soil damp with water. To promote more growth, there's a process called deadheading, and that's picking the dead flowers off to help promote more energy to grow more flowers. Storing your flowers. Fresh, clean water will keep your cut flowers alive longer. Drying flowers can be hung upside down and feel crunchy and sprayed with hairspray for protection. Strawberries. Some variety examples. Seascape, Temptation, Tri-Star, and Bonnie All-Star. These varieties bear fruit during their first year and you get an extended harvest period. Planting notes. Choose a pot that's at least six inch deep with a drainage hole. Plant the strawberry plants about four to eight inches apart. Remove the plants from their container, separate the roots, and make sure the crown of the plant is above the soil line. If you're planting in early spring, pinch off any flowers or buds so the fruit doesn't develop too early. Check in water daily. Moisture is key to plump, juicy berries. Storage. Line a baking sheet or shallow glass bowl with a couple paper towels. Place your unwashed strawberries on a single top, on top in a single layer, then cover with a lid. Refrigerate until ready to eat, normally within seven days. Harvest your strawberries when they are fully formed and evenly red because they will not grow more once what. They, um, strawberries grow best in pots that are in full sun and filled with a high quality potting mix compost blend. Potatoes. Some varieties would be fingerling, gem, red potato, or just trying something new that's not in the grocery store. It is important to note that large potatoes will not have enough room to grow in a full-size pot. How to plant. Cut the seed potatoes into chunks, having at least two eyes each. I do have a picture on the left that shows what the eyes look like. Allow the pieces to dry and callus over about two days. Fill your container with a 50-50 mixture of garden soil and compost. Plant one seed potato for each three gallons container. Need about one to two inches of water per week. How to store potatoes. Potatoes are best kept around 45 to 50 degrees. They should not be stored in the fridge or freezer. The best place is a cool basement or garage as long as it's dry. Potatoes need airflow, so store them in an open bowl or paper bag. Do not store them in a sealed container. How to harvest. Harvest potatoes after the plant flower turns yellow. Stop watering and wait a week. Dig out the potatoes or dump the messy container and sort. Do not be afraid to be messy. This is my favorite part about potatoes is sticking my hand in the soil and pulling them out. 
When potatoes are exposed to direct sunlight, they will naturally start to turn green. Green potatoes are not safe to eat, so either toss it or cut off the green parts. They will taste bitter if you do eat the green parts. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, I'm gonna talk about tools and equipment that I feel are necessary for container gardening. Um, one would be a watering can. There's different styles of watering cans that you can choose. There's the type that is the rain type that um, has a slow trickle of water, but then there's also watering cans that have a spout like a teapot, um, especially for our vegetables that get foliar diseases. I suggest using a watering can that's more like a teapot as opposed to the raining sprinkle type of watering can. Um, if you're growing outdoors, a hose with a watering wand is very efficient. Um, pruners and snips are really important tools to have. Pruners, especially for woody stems and snips are great for herbaceous herbs. Um, to do planting, a hand trowel or a hoary, hoary knife are really great tools. As you can see in the top left, that is a hori hori knife. Um, it's a Japanese style hand trowel essentially, and it has measurements on, on the knife and on the edge it is a sharp serrated edge and that helps you with cutting down weeds or cutting um, herbs. It's really helpful to have that. A hand cultivator is especially helpful for weeding and breaking up the soil surface for planting seeds. Um, garden gloves are essential and kneeling pads are really beneficial to keep those knees protected. Um, plant labels, so you're labeling what you've, what you've grown and the seeds that you've started. Um, a harvest bucket to especially a clean uh, surface. I don't suggest something that's porous, so uh, plastic would be ideal, something that you can wipe down because they do get dirty, but something to harvest your vegetables and your fruits and a compost bin for spent plant material and rotten food. So watering in containers is a little different than growing vegetables in ground. Um, you can do it multiple ways, hand watering um, or drip irrigation. Just depends on the type of system you wanna create and what your budget is. Hand watering is the easiest way, especially for beginners to get started. But if you wanna develop a system where your vegetables are getting watered every morning at the same time, 6 a.m. for example, um, a drip irrigation system kind of uh, takes that work out for you. And if you put it on a uh, timer, it will water your vegetables, your flowers, for example, at the same time every single day. Uh, when you're watering, make sure you're watering the soil and not the foliage. And to check the moisture of your containers, um, I would suggest doing that every single day, but you don't necessarily have to water every day, but it's best to check every single day. Um, the ideal time to water is in the morning um, before the heat of the day sets in, but if that just doesn't work with your work schedule, you can also uh, water in the evening, but um, best time is before work, uh, like early morning. Um, to test your soil moisture, stick your finger down into the soil to the second knuckle. If once you get down to your second knuckle, if it's still dry, that's an indication that it's time to water. And if it's moist, um, hold off, don't water that day and check the next day. Outdoor containers versus indoor containers, um, they do dry out differently. It's very weather dependent. Um, so keep that in mind. Usually indoor containers will not dry out as quickly. So you might be watering them at different days and different times. Um, you may need to adjust the indoor humidity if you're growing tropical plants or citrus or orchids. So you may need to get a dehumidifier, no, sorry, a humidifier to add that humidity to the air. Um, when you're watering, water deeply until the water runs out the drainage holes in the bottom. If your containers are indoors, I suggest putting a tray underneath your pot to capture that water that seeps out and then drain that water from the tray. You wanna make sure your containers are not sitting in that water because um, plants grown in containers will tend to have something called root rot if they're sitting in water. So you wanna make sure that that water is disposed of. And when you're potting up the plant, leave a one 
to two inch dip from the edge of the pot to accommodate the water. Otherwise, the soil and the water will just spill over. So it's best to have a little bit of gap there to keep um, that water sitting on the top of the surface. Um, terracotta pots wick faster than glazed ceramic or plastic containers, so keep that in mind. Know your specific plant and its specific watering needs. Vegetables, for example, like more consistent moisture, whereas herbs like to dry out a bit more before they're watered. And it's more common to overwater than to underwater for containers, especially indoors, so keep that in mind. Okay, fertilizer. Um, you need to fertilize all of your plants, but how much fertilizer and how often really depends on the plant. When you're picking out a fertilizer, they have this ratio. It's called NPK, which is, stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And the ratio can be 10, 10, 10, 20, 20, 20, 32, 10, 10. It just depends on the type of fertilizer. And the first number stands for the nitrogen. The second number in the middle stands for the amount of phosphorus. And the last number is the amount of potassium in your fertilizer. Nitrogen is essential for building amino acids and chlorophyll production. For phosphorus is essential for biochemical reactions and cell growth. Potassium is essential for producing fruits and establishing a really good root system. So fertilize your vegetables every two weeks for flowering or fast growing plants. Uh, fertilize just once or twice a year though for succulents. So you really need to kind of keep in mind what the plant is and that will tell you how often you should fertilize. You have different options for organic and inorganic fertilizers. Organic fertilizer would be things that you can find in nature like compost, leaves, and untreated grass clippings. Um, an inorganic fertilizer is something you can buy at a big box store. They have slow release pellets and the most common brand I see is Osmocote or you have a soluble, a water soluble fertilizer such as miracle Grow. And follow directions on the back, it will tell you how much to add for the size of the container. Um, slow release pellets are really nice because you first put those in when you're planting and depending on the amount that you put in, you might not have to add any more fertilizer for the rest of the growing season. Whereas with soluble fertilizer, you would have to be fertilizing those every two weeks because as you water, you know, the fertilizer will wash out and you'll need to replenish that. And also keep in mind some potting soil bags do have fertilizer included, so keep that in mind. Okay, some common pests that you will see with your container vegetables are mealy bugs. You can see that in the top left corner. They like to hang out on the underside of your leaves. Aphids, which is in the bottom left corner, very small insects also hang out on the underside of your leaves. Scale, that's in the top right corner. It's a insect that will create like a, like a shell over it. And that's why they call it a scale. So you best need to treat those before the scale forms because once that scale has formed over the insect, it's pretty hard to penetrate any pesticides or any kind of mechanical controls over, over it. And then in the bottom right corner, that's spider mites. If you ever see your plants and it has a webbing, that's an indication that it's spider mites, um, very small insects. And then thrips, that's a flying insect, white flies, fungus gnats, caterpillars, and leaf miners. Those are both caterpillars. So to some control methods for our most common uh, insects are organic. That's what we tend to suggest first, see if those are effective. Um, neem oil is very effective against aphids, mites, and spider mites. A organic pesticide called Bacillus thuringiensis, or also called Bt, is really effective against insects that chew on leaves, such as caterpillars. Um, pyrethrin is a broad spectrum pesticide. It comes, it's a byproduct of chrysanthemum flowers and it really affects flying insects and crawling insects. 
but because it's a broad spectrum pesticide, it can kill your bees. So you don't want to apply these, the, this pesticide when it's wet or when the bees are active. And pyrethrin really helps with aphids, leaf hoppers, cabbage loppers, flea beetles, and webworms. Um, spinosad is also a broad spectrum pesticide and can also kill bees. And that's really effective against caterpillars, thrips, leaf miners, and spider mites. And then lastly, insecticidal soap is really effective against mealybugs, aphids, spider mites, thrips, and whiteflies. Um, if you don't have um, a big infestation and you would rather control it um, with more mechanical means, you can handpick the insects, especially if it's not a big infestation. You can handpick those and put them in a bucket of soapy water to kill those. Um, especially with aphids and spider mites, you can spray them with a stream of uh, water from your hose. Make sure you flip the leaf on, you know, over and spray it really hard with the hose that will kind of break off your, your insects and it is effective. And then also sticky traps are a great way to kind of keep track of what insects you have in the area and also if the infestation is, is pretty low can help control it. Okay, so some of the most common diseases are powdery mildew. You can see that in the bottom right corner. That's a fungal disease and it looks like somebody sprinkled baby powder on your leaves. Um, botrytis is in the top left corner, also known as gray mold, um, very common with strawberries. Um, and we will talk about some ways to control that. Um, bacterial leaf spot, that's in the bottom left corner, that's a bacterial infection. Um, anthracnose, that's in the top right corner, that's a fungal disease, very common for tomatoes and peppers. Um, verticillium wilt, Fusarium wilt are both very common fungal diseases for tomatoes and root rot, which I talked about earlier. So some control methods. First, I would say try to buy your plants from a reputable source. Um, a place that you know is, especially if you can buy from a local nursery, that's amazing. And a place that you know that, that they're caring for the plants well. Um, don't reuse the potting mix if you have a disease issue this year. Don't save that potting mix and use it again next year because a lot of fungal diseases will, will uh, overwinter and will stay within that potting mix and then you will have an issue if you plant again the following year. So it's best just to throw it out and start fresh the next year. Um, if you do have a disease problem, it's best to isolate that plant from the others so it won't continue to spread to the other plants in your home or on your deck. Um, one way to prevent the disease from spreading also is not to overwater and to keep those leaves dry. Because like I said, a lot of our diseases are on the foliar, on the, on the leaves. So to keep those leaves dry, it can help uh, keep that disease pressure down. Um, avoid over fertilizing. And if you do have some disease leaves, fruits or flowers, um, try to remove those as soon as possible and don't compost those, just throw those in the trash. And uh, create good aeration and a sunny location that will do a lot. If the uh, disease situation starts to get worse and you feel like it's time to treat them with fungicides, um, copper fungicide is, is very effective for leaf spot, blight, black rot, and powdery and downy mildew. Sulfur is effective against rust, leaf spot, and powdery mildew. And neem oil is effective against scab, anthracnose, verticillium wilt, mildew, rust, blight, and black rot. Okay, some upcoming workshops. We have uh, one coming up on Saturday, March 18th. That's for intermediate vegetable production. That will be a free class over Zoom. It will be a little bit more advanced than today's class. And then we will have an advanced vegetable production workshop coming up in May. Um, the date is to be determined. And some big garden community presentations. We have one coming up March 8th 
on container gardening, gardening at Lorentz Gardens. And on March 25th, that will be on small space gardening at Mulhall's Garden Center. Okay, thank you so much for listening to our presentation today. We hope that you can join us for our workshop in March.